Salvation, a natural result. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. The gospel, when it was produced, when it was inspired in the hearts of men who wrote it down and it's been preserved up to this current time and shall be eternally, when the gospel was produced and inserted into the world, it had an intended purpose. And the intended purpose of the gospel is to have a natural result on our hearts. Okay? The gospel is intended to have a natural result. Now, I'm not talking about natural from the standpoint of, of abiding by the laws of nature like gravity and, th and things of that nature. What I am talking about, though, is what the gospel presents for us. The basic fundamental message of the gospel, when it is implanted into the heart of a human being, there is a natural result that God intended in its production. There is something that He purposed with regard to its ultimate ability. Just in the same way as a piece of fruit is the natural result of the planting of a particular seed and that seed germinating, that seed growing and sprouting and ultimately blossoming and producing an apple. When God produced His Word, He intended for it to be that seed. Matthew 13, Luke chapter 8. Planted into the heart of man that in process of time would naturally develop in our lives into something. What is that natural result that God intended in the production and the preservation of His gospel? Uh, many things that we could mention, but one is obviously at the forefront. And that single most intention within the mind of God in the production of His Word was salvation. If you read the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, although it may touch on many different topics and it may deal with many different themes and many different concepts and touch on many different historical contexts and, and different historical uh, 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 events, there is one ultimate purpose to the Bible, and that is salvation, redemption. The ability for you and me to receive the forgiveness of our sins. One of the best examples in all of the scriptures, in my judgment, of the natural cause or the natural result of salvation as being a product of God's Word implanted into the heart of man is found in Acts chapter 8 from Philip's account with the eunuch in which we see the power of the seed evidently set forth. Now, tonight I want us to just for the next few minutes focus our attention on three things, three concepts that ultimately result in salvation naturally when the Bible, when the Word is implanted in our hearts. And how that Word naturally gets to the point of salvation as it's implanted in the heart of man and develops in its natural course of events. First of all, in Acts chapter 8, we're going to be beginning in verse 26. What we find first of all is that salvation is a natural result to spiritual interest. In Acts 8, beginning in verse 26, what we find is the angel of the Lord speaking to Philip, and he said this, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. 
And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man guide me? And notice what verse 31 says with regard to the eunuch. It says that after Philip said, or after the eunuch said it, that he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. Underline that word desired. Because ultimately to arrive at where the eunuch arrives in verse 40, the final verse of this chapter, the culmination of his obedience, to ultimately arrive at that event in his life, it started with that. It started with desire, with spiritual interest and in what he can learn and what he could do for God. In Acts chapter 8, we find his interest in spiritual things seen by three particular characteristics. Number one, this man had a, an interest in things spiritual based on his recognition of personal insufficiency. Why else would an individual ultimately arrive at the point in their life where they recognize they need to submit their life to God? as their master, as their Lord, as their Savior, if they are personally sufficient to provide all things that might be needed. You see, that makes no sense. If a man had the attitude that he was self-sufficient, even spiritually speaking, he would never arrive at a point to where he said, I need to submit my life to God. Now, first, his spiritual interest would have been seen in his recognition of personal insufficiency. And we know that he felt that way because he was reading the Scriptures. That's what the Bible is able to do for us. It is able to perfect us, to complete us, to equip us. And this man knew that he needed all three of those things, and so he was reading from the Bible. Psalm 119 and verse 105, David wrote, Thy word is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, men read this book because they recognize that without it, they are blind men walking in the dark. And we need something, number one, that's going to open our eyes, and number two, that's going to lighten our pathway. The Bible can do both. We need that spiritual interest that's first going to be, be uh, 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 rooted in the reality of our personal insufficiency. Second, we see his interest in spiritual things in his reading of the Scriptures. He recognized his insufficiency, and so he turned to the Scriptures, recognizing the ability that they have in life. The Word of God is the most marvelous work that has ever been produced. And it's ultimately culminated in passages like Hebrews 4 and verse 12, where the writer said that the Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, there is no other work that has ever been produced in the history of this world, and there will never be another work produced in the future of this world that will ever equate itself to the quality and the power of God's own Word. He recognized his personal insufficiency. He, in that recognition, turned his attention to the one source of wisdom that could complete him. And then number three, we see his spiritual interest in seeking help in understanding the Scriptures. You see, one thing among many, many that I love about the eunuch in Acts 8 is this. Yes, he took the initiative to read the Bible himself. He didn't have to be poked and prodded and encouraged to do it. He did it of his own volition. 
He was on his own with nobody watching. He wasn't care. He did not care what people thought about him. He wasn't doing this just to elevate himself in the sight of men. He was by himself reading his Bible. That says a lot about a man. But even more than that, one thing that I appreciate so much about the eunuch is that when he had difficulty, he was not too proud to ask for help. Philip came to him. He saw him reading the Bible and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And this was the response of the eunuch. How can I except some man shall guide me? He was having difficulty in understanding the context of what Isaiah 53 was actually discussing. Isaiah, what's your point? He couldn't quite grasp it. There wasn't any shame in not understanding, but there would have been shame in not pursuing knowledge. Yes, this man took the initiative to read his Bible, but when he had difficulty understanding it, he took the initiative to find it out. And he said, guide me in my study so that I might know. What ultimately will that understanding that we all are seeking in life bring us? Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. When we forsake a lack of wisdom and pursue true wisdom, Paul says that we are then pursuing the very mind of God. Now is that something that we can ever master? Well, not by any stretch of the imagination. But it's something that is a lifetime pursuit. Something that we're always seeking to achieve in daily study and meditation. 1 John 5 and verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. Do you want to know God? We're going to be talking about that next weekend, or weekend after next. You want to know about God? You've got to go to the source of information. That we may know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. You see, when a man or a, or a woman truly has spiritual interest, when they truly have a desire to learn and to grow and to obey and to live in accordance to God's will, salvation is going to be a natural result of such a mindset. Because with that honesty of desire, they will seek truth. When they find truth, they will accept truth. When they accept truth, they will obey truth. It's a natural cycle in our lives. As evident in Acts 8 from the life of the eunuch. So first of all, we see that salvation is a natural result to spiritual interest. If someone is truly and honestly and sincerely interested in what the Bible and it alone has to say and what the Bible tells them and it alone to do in life, then the natural course of events ultimately in their search for the good treasure is going to lead them to eternal life. Number two, not only do we see in Acts 8 from the eunuch in his desire and spiritual interest that salvation was a natural result in his life based upon all of his activities, but number two, we find that salvation was a natural result to the divine love of God. Now go back to Acts 8 and begin again in verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? 
And then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Of all of the many great chapters on divine love in all of the Bible, and there are many, John 3, 1 John 3, 1 John 4, so many great chapters on divine love in the Bible. One of the greatest is Isaiah 53. When Isaiah pictures for us the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, slain for all the world. And when you read the passage at which the eunuch was reading, and you go back to Isaiah 53, guess what? That's what he was reading. He was reading a chapter about the divine love of God and what God had done and was going to do for us in providing redemption for mankind. And as he read Isaiah 53, he would have seen that the love of God was evident from three particular points. Number one, the love of God in Isaiah 53 was seen in His willingness to suffer. How many of us are going to willingly suffer? Now, yes, there are going to be some causes for which we would willingly suffer. We would suffer likely for our family. We would suffer for very close friends. We would suffer for others for whom we have a great amount of admiration and affection. But let me ask you this. How willing would you be to suffer? Uh, how, how willing would you be to suffer for someone who hated you? For someone who despised you or in the past had used you or persecuted you? Would you step up to the plate and say, no, don't harm them, harm me instead? There would be very few who would step to the plate and show such a degree of affection. And yet, Jesus willingly went to the cross in order to suffer and die, not just for those who had believed Him, not just for those who had obeyed Him and had left all to follow Him, but He went to the cross for those who despised Him. He went to the cross for the Roman soldiers who spit on Him. He went to the cross for the very ones who tore the robe from His back and scourged Him. The love of God in Isaiah 53 was seen in His willingness, willingness to suffer, evident most of all from John 20, where John records that Jesus gave up His life. No man could take it from Him but He gave it up of His own accord. That speaks volumes of the divine love of Jesus and His display on the cross. And it should say a lot about our reaction to it. Not only in Isaiah 53, though, is the love of God seen in His willingness to suffer, it's seen likewise in the, to the extent to which He suffered, the degree to which He suffered. Uh, Roman crucifixion was one of the most cruel avenues of death that this world has ever seen. And, and this world has seen a lot. Uh, if you were to go back and to examine the historical tactics of nations like Assyria or Babylon or the Philistines, and, and look at some of the ways that historically they would put people to death... It would appall you. I could go to my library right now and pull out some notes from people who have done research in this area and just read for you what some of these people have done in the past to put enemies to death. And some here likely would become physically ill at the thought of such practices. And Roman crucifixion is right up there at the very top. It was a cruel, thoughtless, act of torment that our minds honestly cannot comprehend. And Jesus knew that that was what was going to, uh, what He was going to have to endure when He came. And yet, still willingly, He was, he was able to go. And then number three from Isaiah 53, we find the love of God not only seen in His willingness to suffer, the degree to which He suffered, 
But then likewise, we see the love of God in Jesus in all points. There is not an aspect of the life or the work or the character of Jesus that does not display divine love in its purest form. We see His love from the standpoint of His kingdom, from the standpoint of His blood, from the standpoint of His inheritance. And on and on down the line we could go looking at aspects of His love displayed in His work. And friends, when we truly come to appreciate, I mean truly come, not just having a surface appreciation, when we truly come to appreciate the love that has been displayed and is continuing to be displayed for us by His long suffering. And we in purity of heart respond to that love, salvation is going to be a natural result of that love. Because you're going to recognize the love, you're going to want that love displayed in your life and you're going to seek that love in your obedience. It's going to come naturally. But then number three, from, I, from Acts chapter 8 rather, not only do we see salvation as a natural result to the eunuch's spiritual interest, his desire to learn in honesty of heart and purity of heart about the Scriptures, not only do we see it in the divine love of God that the eunuch saw in Isaiah 53, but then finally, we see salvation as a natural result to true biblical faith. In Acts 8, beginning back in verse 36, they went on their way, and they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And, the Philips, and Philip said, If thou believest that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, thou mayest. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. When you have true biblical faith, Salvation is going to be a natural result to come. Now it's not the case that when you develop a faith within your heart that that is the immediate moment at which you're saved. But that is the starting point at which we are motivated to continue in obedience, culminating in that act of obedience in baptism that remits us of our sin, that results in our salvation. But that has to begin somewhere, and friends, the Bible says that that begins in the development of true biblical faith. In what must we believe for that true biblical faith to be developed within our lives? Well, we must believe that Christ is the Son of God. That's evident from what Philip discussed with the eunuch. When the eunuch said, see, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized whereby I might obtain salvation? What was eunuch, uh, Philip's response? If thou believest that Christ is the Son of God, thou mayest. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the writer recorded that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe what? They must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We must believe, have faith in Christ as the Son of God. Likewise, we must have faith in the reality that baptism is the culminating redemptive act in order to obtain that salvation. That's evident again from Acts chapter 8 in which... The eunuch, throughout all that Philip had taught him, got to a particular point in his discussion at which he said, Here is water. Why am I waiting to be baptized? <clears throat> you know, something has always been interesting to me in Acts chapter 8. In Acts 8, 
in verse 35, Luke simply records this about what Philip taught him. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Jesus. Now as far as the actual discussion, the actual words that Philip used, we don't know that. The only information that Luke records is that he preached to him Jesus. But in the process of things, it's interesting to me that in being taught about Jesus, the eunuch knew about the necessity of baptism. How did he know that? Well, he wouldn't have learned it from reading in the Old Testament. The Old Testament did not dis discuss baptism. And so how then would he have come to know under the covenant of Jesus Christ that baptism was a necessity in his life? Would it not naturally conclude that as Philip preached to him Jesus, that he preached to him about the necessity of baptism? If not, how else would he have known that he needed to be baptized? And yet, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And so we must believe that God is right when He says that baptism is that culminating act that began with faith, proceeded through penitence, and eventually arrived at the point of baptism to have our sins washed away. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter recorded that the like figure unto Noah and his family being saved by the waters of the flood, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then number three, we must have faith in God to provide His promise. Is God true to His Word? Uh, to suggest otherwise is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? at least to those of us who believe in God. To believe in God demands that we believe that He is true to His promises. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do we believe that God is true to His Word? Again, sounds like a silly question. But you know what? Many people don't act like it. God said He will save us if we're obedient to Him. And yet all around the world, we have people who are not obedient to Him and they just assume they're going to be saved. There's a sad reality that is awaiting them one day if we cannot first reach them with the message of the gospel. True biblical faith demands, yes, that we believe Christ is the Son of God, it demands that we understand how that faith ultimately is going to work in our lives with regard to our obedience culminating in baptism. But likewise, it demands that we trust God in every conceivable aspect, particularly with regard to the reality of heaven for those who live righteously and hell for those who do not. But if we develop that true biblical faith that the eunuch had developed in his life, truly believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, truly believing that that faith must ultimately culminate in our obedience, and truly believing that God is a God that is true to His Word, that true, honest, pure biblical faith will naturally itself culminate in salvation as it continues through the natural course of time. It's true with the eunuch. And friends, it will be true to us if we develop the same type of spiritual interest, the same reality of divine love, and the same biblical faith that is displayed in Acts chapter 8. Has salvation been produced in your life? If not, is it because you have failed in one of these three areas? Uh, maybe you haven't <clears throat> really had that spiritual interest yet in your life. Maybe you haven't had that true desire. Uh, maybe you've never really come to the reality of the divine love of God and what it can do in your life. 
Maybe you've never developed a true biblical faith. Now, friends, it's not a shame to have not done it yet, but it would be a shame if you left tonight knowing that you needed to, and yet you walked away from this assembly deciding to have not. Why not tonight make that decision to come? Taking that step of obedience. If you're not a child of God, believing that Jesus is the Christ just as the eunuch did, recognizing that in that faith there is something more that must be done. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith and be immersed in water just as the eunuch was to have your sins washed away. Now, maybe you've done all that in the past, but since that time you've been or become like a, a, a character in Acts chapter 8 previous to the account of the eunuch, Simon the sorcerer, who turned his back on God in seeking after those things that were temporal, rather those things that are eternal. And Peter said to him, upon his penitence, pray that these sins might be forgiven thee. Are you away from the fold of God tonight as an erring Christian? You need to come back. Just do what Peter told Simon to do. Repent. Pray that God would forgive you of your great wickedness. And His promise abides with you tonight, in which He'll forgive you, cleanse you of your unrighteousness, and remember your sins and your iniquities no more. Tonight, if you're subject to that invitation and you want salvation to be a natural result in your life, would you come tonight, even now, while together we stand and sing?